Performance comes from inside, not outside. Success is not something you pursue. Success is something you develop. You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. Unless you change how you are, you'll always have what you've got. The major key to your better future is you. The key to a great future is within you, and you'll be able to find it and use it with Success Strategies, Seven Keys to Wealth and Happiness. These keys will help you unlock the door to success that faces every one of us. All we have to do is use the right combination of skills and knowledge. In this exciting program, Jim Rohn will help you find the way to achieve your goals in every area of your life. You don't have to sacrifice family and friends to gain wealth and professional prestige. You just have to have the right plan. And Jim will help you map out your personal path to success, just as he's helped companies around the world reach their goals. You'll benefit from his wisdom and knowledge, gathered in a more than 25-year study of behaviors that affect performance. Jim Rohn has first-hand experience of what these behavioral factors can do. His is the story of a small town boy made good, very good. With the help of a wise mentor to whom he'll introduce you, Jim forged his way right to the top. He'll show you how you can do the same by implementing a few key strategies. In this program, you'll hear how to choose a lifetime of achievement instead of settling for one of mediocrity. You'll discover how to develop the critical advantages that lead to major accomplishments, and you'll learn how to get more satisfaction and enjoyment out of every area of your life, whether it's financial, personal, or professional. Jim Rohn's ideas work, as his clients around the world have discovered. He's earned a reputation as a dynamic and effective trainer all over North America, England, Spain, Taiwan, and Australia. In this program, you too will reap the benefits these companies have paid thousands of dollars for, and you'll have a private one-on-one -on -one session with Jim Rohn. And now, the Nightingale Conan Corporation is very pleased to present Mr. Jim Rohn. This is Jim Rohn. You're going to hear a great number of ideas as you go through the sessions on these six cassettes. Ideas that help successful people accomplish more of their goals, achieve certain wealth, and experience greater joy and satisfaction in their lives. My hope is that you'll find a few of these ideas very useful to you right now. Unfortunately, I don't know you personally. I'm not familiar with your dreams or your problems. But fortunately for you, I don't need to be because the ideas we'll be talking about on these cassettes are fundamentals to the art of winning. They will help you achieve your most inspiring dreams, guaranteed. They are, in fact, the seven fundamentals for wealth and happiness. As we go through these cassettes, you'll see very clearly for yourself just how these ideas can start making a major difference in your life right away. Where did these fundamentals come from? I didn't make them up. I first discovered them when I was 25 years old, at a time in my life when I needed some new ideas to help change the direction of my life. I wasn't destitute at the time, but I certainly needed some help. I guess we could all use a little help at age 25. Let me take a minute to tell you how it happened. I had gotten off to a great start in life. I was raised in farm country in Idaho, a small community of about 5,000 people not far from the Snake River, in the southwest corner of the state, a great place to grow up. In fact, my parents still live in this small farm community. My father is 82 years old, my mother 75, and they are still healthy and doing very well, as active now as they have ever been. I'm very proud of them, and they have always been a great example for me. After graduating from high school, I went to one year of college and then I decided I was smart enough, so I quit, which was one of my major mistakes. Among many major mistakes I made in those early days, 
But I was ambitious and willing to work hard and figured I wouldn't have any trouble getting a job, which turned out to be accurate. So with a head full of dreams and ambitions, I started my first job. About three years later, I got married, made lots of promises, worked hard, and a couple of years later started a family. And at age 25, I started taking a new look at my life. My weekly paycheck amounted to the grand total of $57. I was far behind on my promises, behind on my bills, and discouraged. I was far from making the progress I thought I should have made. I was willing to work hard. That was not my problem. But it was clear that it was going to take more than hard work. And I didn't want to wind up at age 60 broke, needing assistance, like so many people I saw around me, not in the richest country in the world. So what do you do to change the direction of your life? I thought, well, I should go back to school. One year of college doesn't look that good on an application. But now with my family starting, going back to school seemed like a tough decision. I didn't have any money to start my own business. Money was one of my problems. I always had far too much month left over at the end of the money, if you've ever been in that position. I remember one time losing $10 and I was physically ill for two days over a $10 bill. Some of my friends tried to be cheerful. They said, look, maybe some poor person who needed it found it. But that was not really helpful. I must admit at that time in my life, benevolence had not yet seized me. I was the person who needed to find $10, not lose 10. So that's where I was at that time in my life, behind on my dreams, and constantly wondering what I could possibly do to change my life for the better. Well, at age 25, good fortune came my way. And many times it's difficult to explain good fortune. Why do unique things happen to you when they do? I don't know. Part of that is a mystery to me. However, my good fortune was meeting a man, a very unique and successful man. His name was Mr. Earl Schof. When I met him, I said to myself, I would give anything to be like him. I wonder what it would take. Well, to make a long story short, this very special gentleman took a liking to me. And a few months after I met him, he hired me and I went to work for him. I spent the next five years working for him in several of his businesses and then, unfortunately, he died. But I did get to spend five years with this remarkable man. And the best thing he gave me during that five years was not a job. The best thing he gave me was the benefit of his philosophy, the fundamentals of living successfully, how to be wealthy, how to be happy. And sure enough, his ideas worked for me. So I will always be grateful for meeting someone who made a difference in how my life worked out. I am sure if Mr. Schof were still alive, I would have called him one more time today and thanked him for sharing the ideas and inspiration that changed my life. For many years, I shared this philosophy for wealth and happiness with my business partners and met with equally exciting results. I am primarily a businessman, not a professional public speaker. But I have been intrigued with the challenge of trying to put into words the ideas that can make a difference in how a person's life works out. And now I have the chance to share these ideas with you. I don't claim to have all the answers on how to do well, but I do have some answers that have worked extremely well for me and thousands of others. Take these ideas and edit them all you wish. You certainly don't have to buy everything any one person says. But give me a chance. If something sounds good, try it. If it doesn't make sense, discard it. Remember, don't be a follower, be a student. All the ideas we'll discuss in these cassette sessions will stem from a group of very important key concepts. I'd like to begin this session by briefly but clearly looking at each of them. These key words are very important for us to understand if we're to get maximum value from this program and add significantly to our wealth and happiness. The first key word is fundamentals. What a most important word, fundamentals. 
This word calls attention to the primary issue in our quest for greater success. It is the key word in making our lives work well. Fundamentals. Those basics that build the foundation for accomplishment, productivity, success, and lifestyle. Fundamentals form the beginning, the basis, the reality from which everything else flows. And remember, there are no new fundamentals. Fundamentals are old, well-established. Beware of someone who claims to have a new fundamental. That's like someone who claims to manufacture antiques. We would have to be suspicious, right? So fundamentals, basics, they are so very important to understand and consider and practice if you wish for the good life. And may I add here, make sure you don't go looking for the exotic answers to success. Success is a very basic process. It doesn't fall out of the sky. It doesn't have any mysteries, nor does it fall into the realm of the miraculous. Success is merely a natural result that comes from the consistent operation of the practical fundamentals. As someone wisely remarked, to be successful, you don't have to do extraordinary things. Just do ordinary things extraordinarily well. Mr. Schoff, my teacher, gave me many great phrases I'll always remember. One of them was, there are always about a half dozen things that make 80% of the difference. What a key thought, a half dozen things. Whether we are working on our health, wealth, personal goals, or professional enterprise, the difference between our ultimate success or inevitable failure lies in the degree to which we are willing to seek out, study, and to go to work on those half dozen things. For a farmer to reap a plentiful harvest in the fall, for example, the major basics are fairly obvious. Soil, seed, water, sunshine, nourishment, and care. Each fundamental being equally in need of study and attention for together they bring about the best chance for a successful harvest. A good question to ask before undertaking any project or setting any new objective then is what are the most important half dozen things that will make the major difference in how it works out? So whether the enterprise is art or architecture, music or sculpture, mathematics or sports, business or farming, success or lifestyle, it's the fundamentals that count. To understand them and to practice them is to take the first intelligent step toward accomplishing your objectives and living your dreams. The second key word for us to consider is wealth. Wealth is a word that brings about a wide variety of mental images. And that is part of my purpose in these cassettes, to provoke that wide variety of mental images. For that is where the dreams are, that is where the inspiration comes from, and that is where true incentive is born. The mystery and mixture of mental image, the stuff and the staff of life. Its right use, its constant use, is the way to a life unique and a life abundant. Now to one, wealth means having enough financial substance to be able to do whatever you wish to do with your life. To another, it may mean freedom from debt, freedom from the constant claim of obligation. To yet another, it means opportunity. And to many, wealth means a million dollars. That's a unique word, millionaire. It rings of success, freedom, power, influence, pleasure, possibility, benevolence, and excitement. Not a bad mental image. Now we could talk of the wealth of experience, the wealth of friends, the wealth of love, the wealth of family the wealth of culture, wealth of many kinds. However, in this program, we are more specifically going to talk about wealth in the sense of financial freedom, wealth that comes from the conversion of effort and enterprise into currency and equity. For each of us, the amount of money required to be wealthy will differ. But the dream for all of us, I'm sure, is the same. Freedom from financial pressure, more freedom of choice, freedom to enjoy, and the opportunity to create and to share. Wealth, the possession of great financial resources that improves the quality of your life and gives you added dignity and expanded lifestyle. So decide for yourself what wealth means to you. Latch on to your own mental image of wealth. 
and let's see if the ideas I'm about to bring to you will make sense and perhaps provide you with the inspiration to put the plan into high action so that as the days pass, you will discover a growing sense of freedom and dignity, self-worth, substance, and lifestyle. The next key word is happiness, the universal quest. Happiness is a joy that most often comes as a result of positive activity. Like wealth, it too has a wide variety of meanings and interpretations. Happiness is both the joy of discovery and the joy of knowing. It is a result of an awareness of the full range of life, the color, the sound, the harmony. And it is the joy that comes from designing a life and practicing the fine art of living well. Happiness is being able to explore the offerings of life by perception, response, and enjoyment. Happiness is both receiving and sharing, reaping and bestowing. It is being able to feast on harmony as well as food, on ideas as well as bread. Happiness is the deliberate act to create a wider world of experience and awareness. Happiness is having a handle on disappointment. It is being in control of both emotion and circumstance. Happiness is freedom from the negative children of fear, such as worry, low self-esteem, envy, greed, anger, resentment, and so on. Happiness is an awareness and a grasp of the positive power of life and loving values. It is an order of thought, activity, and lifestyle. Happiness is values in balance. It is contact with people of substance. Happiness is contentment with the tasks of your life. It is thought inspired by, organized with, and rooted in your personal philosophy. Happiness is a life well lived in which a wide variety of experiences are deliberately captured to become an invaluable form of currency for you to spend and invest in your own better future. Happiness is activity with purpose. It's love in practice. Happiness is both a grasp of the obvious as well as an awe of the mysterious. But for most people around us, happiness seems to be either something left behind or something yet to be discovered. Like all the good things in life, happiness is elusive by nature, but not impossible to capture. A major key for bringing joy into our lives lies in the next word we shall briefly examine. Discipline. If there is a magic word that stands out above all the rest, this is the one. Discipline. And in this program, you'll discover how positive this word is. Discipline is the bridge between thought and accomplishment. The bridge between inspiration and value achievement. The bridge between necessity and productivity. Remember, all good things are upstream. The passing of time takes us a-drifting, and drifting only brings us the negative, the disastrous, the disappointment and the failure. Failure is not a cataclysmic event. It is not generally the result of one major incident, but rather a long list of accumulated little failings. Failing in life is failing to think today, failing to act today, failing to care, to strive, to climb, to learn, to keep trying day by day. If your goal requires that you write ten letters today and you write only three, you are down seven letters. If you want to make five calls and you only make one, you are down four on calls. If your plan calls for saving $10 today and you save none, you're down $10 today. Now the danger is looking at an undisciplined day and concluding that no great harm has been done. It doesn't seem like such a bad day, but add up these days to make a year and then add up those years to make a lifetime and perhaps you can now see how repeating today's small failures can easily turn your life into a major disaster. Success, on the other hand, is just the same process in reverse. If you plan to make 10 calls and you end the day making 15, now you're up five calls. If you then get up a few on letters, move up the savings numbers, you can see what a massive difference it could make in a year and what wealth and accomplishment awaits for a lifetime. Discipline is like a set of magic keys that unlocks all the doors of wealth, happiness, sophistication, culture, high self-esteem, pride, joy, accomplishment, satisfaction, 
and success. The first key to discipline is awareness of the need for and the value of discipline, and especially the discipline to make the changes. What will it take? What must I do? And what must I become to get all I want from my life? The second key is the willingness. More than that, the eagerness to maintain your new discipline deliberately, wisely, consistently. And the third key to discipline is the commitment to master the circumstances of your daily life, to see and harness the opportunities to make something of the sun and the rain, the good as well as what comes in the guise of misfortune. Discipline does many things, but most important of all is what it does for you. It makes you feel better about yourself. Even the smallest discipline can have an incredible effect on your attitude. And the good feeling you get, that surging feeling of self-worth that comes from starting a new discipline, is almost as good as the feeling that comes from the accomplishment of the discipline. Second, a new discipline immediately alters your life direction. You don't change destinations immediately. That is yet to come. But you can change direction immediately. And direction is very important. Third, discipline cooperates with nature. Everything strives. It is a common life function. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it can. Everything strives to become all it can possibly be. And that striving to become is what discipline is all about. Disciplining ourselves to fulfill our natural potential to become all that we can be. And finally, Discipline attracts opportunity. Opportunity is always looking for ambition and skill in action. Discipline taps the unlimited power of commitment. The human will in action, driven by inspiration, enticed by desire, tempered by reason, guided by intelligence, can bring you to that high and lofty place called the good life. Discipline, those unique steps of intelligent thought and activity, that put a lid on temper and a faucet on courtesy, that develop positive and control negative, that encourage success and deter failure, that design lifestyle and control frustration, that enhance health and curb sickness, that promote happiness and manage sadness. Discipline, the start and the continuing process that brings all good things. And remember, anyone can start the process it's not if I could, I would. It's if I would, I could. If I will, I can. So start the new process. You can begin a new habit no matter how small it is. Small isn't important. Whether or not you start and whether or not you continue are all that is important. And don't be deluded by an affirmation. Only affirm what you are truly prepared to do. Many of us delude ourselves with our words into believing that we're making changes and making progress when in fact our daily activity is taking us in the exact opposite direction of our affirmations. Why would you walk in the opposite direction of your dreams? The man dreams of wealth and walks daily towards certain financial disaster. The man wishes for happiness and thinks the thoughts and commits the acts that take him to certain despair. So to have a prosperous life, start a prosperity plan. To become wealthy, start a wealth plan. Remember, you don't have to be wealthy to have a wealth plan. A person with no means can have a rich plan. If you are ill, start a health plan. If you don't have energy, start an energy plan. If you don't feel good, start a feel-good plan. If you're not smart, start a smart plan. If you can't, start a can plan. If you haven't, start a have plan. Anyone can. Even a bad person can start hearing good messages and reading good books. Recognize that the start of the better life, the happy life, the wealthy life, is today. This is exciting. Both the process and the result can begin today. Start the new journey today. If you think of a new idea, today is the day to begin the discipline of putting that idea into action. Set this day up as a long, busy, exciting start for your new life. Get your first book for your new library today. Begin your new practice of setting goals today. Start clearing out a drawer of your new orderly desk 
today. Start eating an apple a day on your new health plan today. Put some money in your new investment for fortune account today. Start reading with intensity for your new wealth of mind plan today. Write a postponed letter today. Make a delayed telephone call today. Pick up your camera and take a picture of something to start your new treasury of photographs today. Get some momentum going on your new commitment to the better life. See how many activities you can pile on in this first day. Go all out. Break away from the negative downward pull of gravity. Start the thrusters going. Prove to yourself that waiting is over. Hoping is past, and that faith and action have now taken charge. It's a new day, a new beginning for your new life. With discipline, you can't believe the list of positive moves you can make in the first day of your new beginning. What have you got to lose? Only the despair and fear and guilt of the past. Only the dissatisfaction and unhappiness and lack of fulfillment of the past. Only the frustration and low self-esteem. Of the past. Take great pleasure in assisting in your own new birth, no matter how successful you may already be. Now I offer you the next challenge: make this new first day a part of the week of new beginnings. See how many things you can continue and start. In this week of new beginnings, then make it the first month of the new beginnings, then the first year of the new beginning. By the time that first year is finished, you will never again be claimed by the past, past habits, past influences, past regrets, or past failures. You are ready to, as the Bible phrase says, fly with the eagles, and you will have begun your certain journey toward the last key concept we'll discuss. On this cassette, success. Success is both a journey and a destination, isn't it? It is both the steady, measured progress toward a goal, and the achievement of a goal. Success is an accomplishment, whether it be great or small, and it's an understanding of the potential and power of an entire human life. Success is an awareness of value, and it's the cultivation of value through discipline. It can be tangible or intangible. Success is a process of turning away from something in order to turn towards something else. From no exercise to exercise, from candy to fruit, from not investing to investing. Success is responding to an invitation, an invitation to change, to grow, to develop, to become, to move up to a better place with a better vantage point. But most of all. Success is making your life what you want it to be, considering all the possibilities, considering all the examples. What do you want for your life? That is the big question. Remember, success is not a set of standards from our culture, but rather a collection of personal values, clearly defined and ultimately achieved. Success is your better life for you, the design you give it, the dreams you accomplish. Making your life what you want it to be for you—that is success. All right. With that overview of some of the key concepts we'll explore in this program, let's begin the further development of your success by looking at the art of properly selecting and setting goals. I think you'll hear a couple of thoughts you've never heard before. Of all the things that changed my life for the better most quickly, it was learning how to set goals. And mastering this unique process can have a powerful effect on your life too. One morning at breakfast, shortly after I met Mr. Shelf, he asked me if he could see my current list of goals. He said, "Let me see your list of goals, and let's go over them and talk about them." 
Maybe that's the best way I can help you right now. And I said, I don't have a list. He said, well, is it out in the car or at home somewhere? I said, no, sir. I don't have a list anywhere. He said, well, young man, that's where we better start. Then he added, if you don't have a list of your goals, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars, which he did. And that got my attention. I said, you mean that if I had a list of goals, that would change my bank balance? He said, drastically. That day I became a student of how to set goals. And sure enough, when I learned how, my whole life changed. My income, my bank account, my personality, my lifestyle, my accomplishments. So I'd like to share with you the best I have learned and practiced on goal setting. First of all, I'd like to say that we are all affected by five factors. The first is environment. The second is events. The third is knowledge. The fourth is results. And the fifth and often overlooked factor that affects our lives is our view of the future, our dreams. I won't get into all of these influences here, but let me concentrate on the fifth one, dreams. Of all these five influences, make sure your dreams are the greatest influence on your daily decisions and activities. Put another way, make sure that the greatest pull on you is the pull of the future. For your dreams to greatly influence you, for the future to pull you, your future must be well planned. There are two ways to face the future. One is with apprehension, the other with anticipation. Guess how many people face the future with apprehension? Why? They don't have it well designed. And without really thinking about it, they have probably bought someone else's view of how to live. You will face the future with anticipation when you have planned a future you can get excited about. When you have designed your future results in advance. In this way, the future will capture your imagination. It will exert an enormous influence on you. And to design your future, you must have goals. Well-defined goals are like a magnet. They pull you in their direction. And the better you have defined them, the better you have described them, the harder you work on them, the stronger they pull. And they pull you through all kinds of difficulties too. Without goals, it is easy to let life deteriorate to the point where you're just making a living. It is not difficult to get trapped by economic necessity and settle for existence rather than substance. We all have a choice. We can either make a living or design a life. Mr. Shove said to me, I don't think your current bank balance is a true indicator of your level of intelligence. I was happy to hear that. He said, I think you have plenty of talent and ability and that you're much smarter than your bank balance indicates. And that turned out to be true. I was much smarter. My question to him was, then why isn't my bank balance bigger? And he said, you don't have enough reasons for accomplishing great things. If you had enough reasons, you could do incredible things. You have enough intelligence, but not enough reasons. That's the key, if you had enough reasons. In my years of study, I've also discovered this. Reasons come first, and answers come second. Life has a strange way of hiding all the answers and disclosing them only to people who have been inspired to look for them, who have reasons to look for them. Put another way, when you know what you want, and you want it badly enough, you will find ways to get it. The answers, the methods, the solutions will become evident to you. Hey, what if you had to be rich? Are there any books and tapes on the subject? The answer is yes. There are plenty of good ones. But if you don't have to be rich, you probably won't read the books or listen to the tapes. What drives us to find the answers is necessity. So work on your reasons first, answer second. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? It varies from person to person. 
I'm sure that if you did a little soul searching, you could come up with a fairly strong list of reasons why you want to accomplish great things. There are personal reasons, sometimes uniquely personal reasons. Some people do well for the recognition. Some do well because of the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. That's one of the best reasons. I have some millionaire friends who keep working 10 to 12 hours a day making more millions. And it's not because they need the money. It's because of the joy, pleasure, and satisfaction that come to them from being constant winners. To them, money is not their main drive. It's not the money. It's the journey. Once in a while, someone says to me, if I had a million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. Hey, that's probably why the good Lord sees to it that he doesn't get his million. Because he'd just quit. Family is another reason or motivator for doing well. Some people do extremely well because of other people. And that's a powerful reason. Sometimes we will do things for someone else that we would not do for ourselves. We are made that way. I met a man who once said to me, Mr. Rohn, to do everything I want to do around the world with my family, I need at least a quarter of a million dollars a year. I thought, incredible. Could a man's family affect him that much? And the answer is, of course. How fortunate are the people who find themselves greatly affected by someone else. It's powerful. Benevolence. The desire to share can be a powerful reason for wanting to achieve. Some people do extremely well gathering up resources so they can then be benefactors. When Andrew Carnegie, the great steel magnet, died, his desk was opened and in one of the desk drawers was found a slip of paper. On that slip of paper, Mr. Carnegie had written his goal for his life and he wrote it when he was in his 20s. On that slip of paper, he had written I'm going to spend the first half of my life accumulating money. I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. That's terrific. He was so inspired by that goal that during the first half of his life, he accumulated $450 million. And during the last half of his life, he gave it all away. How powerful. What has you turned on? What has you getting up early, hitting it hard all day and staying up late? What has you inspired? Next question, what's got you turned off? When I found the answers to those two questions, my life exploded into change. I finally found out what negative philosophy of life I had allowed to limit me and had me turned off. And I got that cured. Then I found a long enough list of reasons to turn me on. And once the lights went on for me at age 25, they have never gone out. I've fallen out of the sky a few times, but I've never lost that drive to do something unique with my life. Now there's another list of reasons for doing well called nitty gritty. Those hard little reasons that can really affect your life. Sometimes it doesn't take much of a goal to start you in a brand new life direction. I now carry a few hundred dollars in my money clip. It's only a few hundred dollars, but the story behind why I do it reveals one of those reasons that greatly affected me. Just before I met Mr. Schof, I heard a knock at my door one day. When I opened it, there was a little girl selling Girl Scout cookies. And she gave me one of the finest sales presentations I've ever heard. A special deal, several flavors, and only $2. Back when you could get a lot for $2. And with a big smile, she very politely asked me to buy. And I wanted to. Big problem. I didn't have $2. And to this day, I can still clearly remember the pain and the embarrassment. I was a father. I had been to college, I was working, and I didn't have two dollars. Now, since I didn't want to tell her that, I did what I thought was next best. I lied to her. 
I said, hey, I've already bought lots of Girl Scout cookies. I've still got plenty stacked in the house. Now, that wasn't true, but it seemed to get me off the hook for the moment. She said, that's wonderful, sir. Thank you very much. And she went away. After she had left, I closed the door, and that was the day I said, I don't want to live like this anymore. I've had it with being broke, and I've had it with lying. I've had it with being embarrassed over not having any money in my pocket. I promised myself that day that this would never happen again. I picked a day and an amount, and I said, I'll never carry less. It was one of those reasons that still affects my life after all these years. So I now carry a few hundred dollars in my money clip. I do that for two reasons, I guess. One reason is the way it makes me feel, that special feeling of having plenty. Mr. Shove said to me, the first $500 you earn, put into your pocket, not in the bank. It feels much better in your pocket than it does in the bank. I've found that's true. But I also carry plenty in case I bump into another Girl Scout who's selling cookies. I'm ready. I remember walking out of the bank one day in Northern California where I lived at the time, and there were two little girls selling candy right outside the bank for some girl's organization. The first little girl walked up to me and said, Mr. Would you like to buy some candy? I said, I probably would. What kind is it? She said, it's Almond Roca. I said, that's my favorite. She said, wonderful. I asked, how much is it? She said, it's only $2. I thought, it couldn't be still $2 after all these years. I couldn't help remembering the Girl Scout and the cookies. I said, how many boxes of that candy have you got? She said, I've got five. And the other little girl standing there, she was selling candy too. I asked, how many boxes do you have? She said, I've got four. I said, that's nine. I'll take them all. They said, really? I said, yes, I've got some friends, so I'll pass them around. They got so excited, put all this candy together. I reached into my pocket and gave them $18. Now, when I've got the candy and they've got the money, that first little girl looks up and says, Mr., you are really something. How about that? Can you imagine only spending $18 and having someone look at you in the face and say, you are really something? Now you know why I carry heavy. I'm not going to miss those chances anymore. It was a small goal, just a few hundred dollars, but it had a big effect on my life. I have a dear friend, Robert DePew. Bobby used to be a school teacher in Lindsay, California, the olive capital. After he taught school for several years, he became a little weary of teaching and decided to get into sales. One day, without telling anyone, he quit his teaching job and jumped into sales. When he did, his brother poked fun at him. His brother said, you're going to go right down the drain. You had a good teaching job. Now you're going to lose everything you have. You must be out of your mind. He put him down something fierce. Bobby said the way my brother acted made me so angry, I decided to get rich. Today, Robert happens to be one of my millionaire friends. The attainment of wealth is not just a matter of intelligence. Mostly, it's a matter of inspiration. So if you have strong enough inspiration, a strong enough reason, large or small, it can have an incredible influence on the direction of your life. Now we're going to take some time to actually start designing the next 10 years of your life. We're going to start setting your goals. Goal setting is one of the most important skills to develop if you want to design your future. I'm going to give you enough homework not only to keep you busy for the rest of your life, but also to help you create the kind of life you may have always dreamed about living but never believed possible. So let's get on with it. The sooner you exert the discipline, the sooner you will be enjoying the results. Once the results start to come, believe me, 
you won't mind the hard work and discipline it's going to take. Now, get a sheet of paper, and at the top of it, write the words, long-range goals. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to jot down the answers. If you don't have paper and pen handy, follow along with me now anyway, just listening. Then later, listen again when you can write down your ideas. After I've asked the questions, which is the first part of this exercise, you can stop the tape and work on your answers. All right, let's start this exercise. The basic question you are going to answer is, what do I want within the next one to 10 years? I want you to take about 12 to 15 minutes and make a list of at least 50 things you want within the next one to 10 years. These are long range goals. To help you get started with your list, consider these questions. What do I want to do? What do I want to see? What do I want to be? What do I want to have? Where do I want to go? And what would I like to share? Now, with these thought starter questions in mind, answer the basic question. What do I want within the next one to 10 years? See how many things you can write down. At this point, don't take the time to describe in detail everything you want. This is the time for you to let your thoughts pour, to write fast and to abbreviate. For example, if you just write down 380, you'll know what that means. You don't have to describe the color and the interior of the car. You'll do that later in this exercise. I want you now just to abbreviate and write fast. Make the list as long as you possibly can. Try to write down at least 50 items, 50 things you want within the next one to 10 years. These are long range goals. Spend about 12 to 15 minutes on this. After you've completed your list, you're ready for the next part of the exercise. Go through your list, and next to the things you think you can accomplish or acquire a year from now, write a number one. Next to the things you think it will take three years to realize, write a three. Next to the things it will take five years to accomplish, write a five. And next to the things it will take 10 years to accomplish, write a 10. Go through this list now to the best of your ability and say, that looks like it will take me about a year, or three years, or five years, or 10 years. Some big goals might be out there 10 years from now. Once you complete this part of the exercise, you might come to the conclusion that you need a lot more three-year goals and less one-year goals, for example, or that you need more 10-year goals. You see, while you're working on one goal, you must have something else in the planning stages. If you don't, what happened to some of the early Apollo astronauts could happen to you. After they came back from the moon, some of those astronauts experienced deep psychological and emotional problems. And the reason for that, why after you've been to the moon, now where do you go? That seemed to be the end, the finish. What later astronauts did was to make sure that they had major projects lined up after they returned from the moon trip. The way you enjoy life best is to wrap up one goal and start right on the next one. Don't linger too long at the table of success. The only way to enjoy another meal is to get hungry. Another thing to check for on your list is that you have included goals for each of these three important categories. First, make sure you've listed your economic goals your goals for income, profits, and productivity. Second, make certain your list includes material items you want, tangibles, such as a home, a car, a boat, furniture, or jewelry. Don't attach the wrong importance to things, but they are important. Third, you'll want to include on your list goals for personal development. Write down all your personal development goals, your goal is to be more physically fit, to lose weight, to be more decisive, to be a more effective leader, to be a better communicator, to learn another language. Of course, there are other types of goals to consider, family goals, social goals, lifestyle goals. This is pretty heavy homework, but remember, whether or not you do your homework 
shows up in the marketplace as well as in the classroom. After you have determined which of your goals are one year, three year, five year, and ten year, and after you've made certain your list includes economic goals, things, and personal development goals, I want you to go back to this list again. Now pick out the four most important one-year goals, the four most important three-year goals, the four most important five-year goals, and the four most important ten-year goals. Those 16 goals will give you plenty of work for now. Get out some more paper, and in a brief paragraph, describe each goal. How high, how long, how much, what size, what model, what color, for example. Also describe why it is important to you. This is a process where you either talk yourself into it or talk yourself out of it, which is good. When you're unclear as to why something is important, usually you put only half-hearted effort into it. What you want is a powerful motivator, but the reason why you want it is an even more powerful motivator. It has greater pull. You may find that some of your goals you thought at first glance were important are not important after all. Do some reflecting, refining, and revising. The point is, right now, try to have approximately four one-year, three-year, five-year, and ten-year goals that you truly believe in, that inspire you, that you've sold yourself on. When these goals and the reasons you want to obtain them are each clearly described in a brief paragraph, transfer this information to a journal or some type of notebook that you can carry with you easily and refer to often. It's essential to set aside some time every week to review all of your goals, to rearrange them, redo them, restructure them, to add goals, or to tear up the whole list and start over. Goal setting is not something you do just once. It's a continual process. Also, you must constantly check your progress toward your goals. You don't want to fall too far behind on, or worse, lose sight of, your important goals. Now, just as important as your long-range goals are your short-range goals. Your goals for tomorrow, next week, next month, six months from now. These are goals you can accomplish within the next year, the immediate future. We call these goals confidence builders. When you work hard, burn the midnight oil, and accomplish these little things, it builds your confidence to go for your long-range goals. Write down in your notebook or journal all the little things you would like to have or accomplish in the next year. How you set up this list is up to you. You might want to break it down by week or by month. Set it up in whatever way works well for you. Part of the fun of having a list is being able to check off something as obtained or completed. Every week, try to check off at least one thing on your list of short-term goals. And when you are able to check off something major, something on your list of long-range goals, celebrate. Make winning joyful. Congratulate yourself. It is very important to celebrate progress. We grow from two experiences. One is the joy of winning, and the other is the pain of losing. Here's what that also means. Make losing painful. Put it on yourself. If you set something up, fooled around, didn't pull it off, put it on yourself. And get around people who will help in this area. Hey, don't join an easy crowd. Go where the expectations are high, where the pressure to perform is high. It's how we grow. I'm certain that part of the reason why people let goal setting slide is because it is a lot of work. As I said, you'll be constantly revising your lists of short range and long range goals, rearranging them, refining them, redesigning them, establishing different priorities, adding new goals, perhaps deleting others. It's interesting that so many people work hard on their jobs, but they don't work hard on their futures. They let that slide. Some people live such mediocre lives that at the end of the day, they don't know whether they're winning or losing. They just go through life with their fingers crossed. I know most people don't make definite plans, but don't let that be you. The guy says, well, you work where I work, but the time you get home, it's late. 
You've got to have a bite to eat, watch a little TV, and get to bed. You can't sit up half of the night and plan, plan, plan. And this is the guy who's behind on his car note. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere. But I've discovered that you can be sincere and work hard all your life and wind up broke and embarrassed. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good planner, a good goal setter. You've heard the old saying, the people who fail to plan are planning to fail. It's true. So work on your plans. Put yourself in the top few percent who put this power to work for themselves. Writing your goals down also shows you are serious. And to do better, you must get serious. You don't have to be grim, but you do have to be serious. Hey, everybody hopes things will get better, but remember, the future does not get better by hope. It gets better by plan. And hope unaided by clear plans can finally become an illness. There's a Bible phrase that says, hope long delayed makes the heart sick. It's a sickness. I used to have the illness known as passive hope. It's bad. And there's one that is even worse, and that is called happy hope. That is really bad. The man is 50, and he's broke, and he's still smiling. That's bad. So get serious. Make plans. Put them on paper. My suggestion from experience. There's a phrase from the Bible that goes, without dreams and vision, we perish. How true. Humans have this unique ability to aspire, to dream, to go for something, to become something. Without that, life is not life. We must have dreams and never give up on our dreams. I'd like to share with you some further observations I've made on goal setting. Understand that your goals, whatever they are, are affecting you all day long. Your goals affect your handshake, your attitude, how you feel. Your goals affect how you look, how you dress, how you walk, how you talk, all day, every day. Your personality, conversation, activity, it's all affected by your goals. I asked a man one time, what are your goals for this month? And he said, if I could just scrape up enough money to pay these lousy bills. That was his goal. Hey, I'm not saying it isn't a goal. It is, but it's such a poor goal. It certainly isn't inspiring. You don't jump out of bed on Monday morning and say, oh boy, another chance to go out and scrape up the money to pay these lousy bills. The point is that goals should be fun. They should be big, challenging, rewarding. They should allow you to grow. Remember, too, that the major purpose of having a goal is not just to acquire the goal. The major reason for setting goals is to compel yourself to become the person it takes to achieve them. In other words, attaining the goal is of secondary importance. What's far more important is what you become in the pursuit of it. The greatest value in becoming a millionaire, for example, is not the million dollars. The greatest value is the skills, the knowledge, the discipline, and the leadership qualities you acquired in becoming a millionaire. It's the experience you acquired in planning, development, strategy. It's other qualities you acquired, such as courage, commitment, and willpower, to attract a million dollars. You could lose everything you attained but you could not lose the skills, knowledge, and experience you have obtained. Even better than having is being. Here's a most important question to spend some time answering. What kind of person will I have to become to get all I want? Write down a few thoughts on that. Write down some skills you'll have to develop, for example, and some of the things you're going to have to learn. 
Just spend a little time writing a few sentences on this. What kind of person will I have to become to get all I want? The answer to this will give you some personal development goals. Remember that income does not far exceed personal development. All of us have to do this kind of self-examination. I have to look at my own life and say, well, here's what I want, but am I willing to become what it takes to get what I want? If I'm too lazy, if I don't want to learn, read, study, and grow to become that kind of person, then I cannot attract what I want. Now, either I have to change my wants or I have to change myself. Here are a few more key points I'd like to share with you on goals and designing your future. First, if you don't right now feel as if you're equipped to get all you want, just remember, ability will grow to match your strong dreams. That's why the goal setting process we've discussed is so important. The more you work on this, the more ideas you will get on how you can change, how you can grow. I am nowhere near the person I was when I met Mr. Shove 25 years ago. I'm not that person anymore. I've changed. There's nothing you can do about the past, but you can do a great deal about your future. You don't have to be the same person you were yesterday. You can make changes in your life, absolutely startling changes, in a fairly short period of time. You can make changes you can't even conceive of now. If you give yourself a chance, your abilities will grow. You have untapped talents and potential that you haven't even reached for yet. And as time goes on, you'll be able to reach deeper and deeper. The first thing you'll know, you'll be able to do things you never thought you could do. You'll be able to handle things you never thought you could handle. You'll have ideas that you've never had before. All of this is sparked by the goal setting process. When you know what you want and you want it badly enough, the answers will come to you. I can't tell you why it works. All I know is it works. Give yourself a chance to become all you can become and to accomplish all you can accomplish. Let me give you a Bible philosophy that teaches how to get whatever you want. Here's what it says. Ask. That's it. Ask. Of all the important skills to learn in life, be sure to include the skill of asking. What does ask mean? Ask means, what do you want? And the complete formula is staggering. It says, ask and you will receive. Hey, we ought to look into that. The man says, yes, but you work where I work. By the time you struggle home, it's late. You've got to get a bite to eat, watch a little TV and get to bed. You can't sit up half the night and ask, ask, ask. And this guy is behind on his bills. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you've got to do better than work hard and be sincere all of your life. You'll wind up broke and embarrassed. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good asker. Let me give you some key points on this asking and receiving, setting goals, asking of life. Here's part of the philosophy that helped me to change. First, asking starts the receiving process. Asking is like pushing a button and all this machinery starts working, mental and emotional machinery. I don't even know how it works, but I do know it works. There are a lot of things you don't need to know how they work. Just work them. Some people are always studying the roots. Others are picking the fruit. It all depends on what end of it you want in on. So asking is the beginning of receiving. Second, receiving is not the problem. You don't have to work on receiving. It's automatic. So if receiving is not the problem, what is the problem? It's failing to ask. The man says, I see it now. I got up every day this year and hit it hard, but nowhere in my house is there a list of what I want from my life. Can you see? Good worker, poor asker. Third, receiving is like the ocean. There's plenty, especially in this country. It's like an ocean here. Here, success is not in short supply. 
It isn't rationed so that when you step up to the window, it's all gone. No, no. Well, if that's true, what is the problem? Well, the problem is some people go to the ocean with a teaspoon. Have you got the picture? A teaspoon. What I suggest you do in view of the size of the ocean is trade your teaspoon for at least a bucket, and you will look better at the ocean with a bucket. Kids won't make fun of you. Now, here's something else to remember about asking. There are two ways to ask. One is ask with intelligence. It didn't say ask intelligently, but I'm sure it meant that. Don't mumble. You won't get anything by mumbling. Be clear, be specific. Intelligent asking means how high, how long, how much, when, what size, what model, what color. Describe what you want. Define it. Remember, well-defined goals are like magnets. The better you define them, the stronger they pull. And give your goals purpose. Answer both questions. What do I want? That's the object. And the second question, what for? That's purpose. Purpose is stronger than object. What you want is powerful and it will pull, but what you want it for is more powerful. Here's the second way to ask. Ask with faith. Faith is the childish part. It means believe you can get what you want like a child, not an adult. Many adults are too skeptical. They've lost that wonderful childlike faith and trust. Don't let that happen to you. Believe in, have faith in yourself and your goals. And get excited like a child. Childlike enthusiasm. Nothing can beat it. Kids think they can do anything. How exciting. They hate to go to bed at night and can't wait to get up in the morning. Develop that kind of enthusiasm toward your life and your goals. And be curious like a child. Kids can ask a thousand questions. Just when you think they're finished, they come up with a thousand more. They'll drive you to the brink. But it's really a virtue. Have plenty of curiosity. Ask questions. That's how you learn. Another fringe benefit of setting goals is what it does for your ability to manage your time effectively. This is no small thing. We'll look at time management in detail in a later session, but now, while we're talking about goals, I'd like to share a few ways your use of time are affected by or influence the achievement of your goals. Have you ever thought that without some very clear written goals, you never even need to consider managing your time? Time essentials come from objectives well-defined. Time can't be critical if objectives aren't defined. Now, you might be one of those uniquely fortunate individuals who can keep all their objectives and purposes clearly defined in their minds and operate from that. But I wouldn't take the chance. Write your goals down and set careful priorities. Sometimes priorities are determined by the season. For a farmer in springtime, the season dictates his most important activities. During the spring, a farmer must work around the clock, burn the midnight oil, and keep the equipment running because he has only this small window of time for the planting of his crops. One of the difficulties of living in an industrialized society is the losing of the sense of seasons, when to pour it on, when to ease back, when to take advantage. It's easy to keep going from nine to five, year in and year out, and lose a natural sense of priorities and appropriate time. Don't let one year just blend into the next. Keep an eye on your own seasons, lest you lose track of values and substance. Part of setting priorities is learning to separate major activities from minor activities. This is a whole skill in itself, but once you have learned it, it will pay dividends you won't believe. So learn to put everything on your mental scales to be carefully weighed before you spend time or money. And here's a good question to constantly ask. Is this a major or a minor? By asking that question, you will reduce the amazingly natural tendency to spend major time on minor things. In sales training, we are taught that major time is the time spent in the presence of the prospect. 
while minor time is the time spent on the way to the prospect. If you're not careful, you will spend more time on the way to than in the presence of. So in sales we teach, don't go across town till you've gone across the street. Wouldn't it be wise to make an evaluation if you're in sales and ask, how much time am I spending in the presence of and how much time on the way to? Majors and minors, what a great discipline to exercise. It also reads, don't spend minor time on major things. It's easy to get values mixed up. The man spends three hours watching television and only 30 minutes playing with his kids. Something is probably out of line there, right? It also reads, don't spend major money on minor things. If you spend more on candy than on audio cassettes like this or books, that would be foolish, right? Here is a great goal achieving tip. Don't mistake movement for achievement. It's possible to be busy all day, come home exhausted, and only then realize that very little of your day consisted of productive activities in the pursuit of your goals. Don't get faked out by being busy. The man says, I've been going, going hard all day. I've really put in the hours and the effort. But here's the major question, doing what? It isn't going, going hard all day that counts. It's the doing what? The value that counts. Another essential is concentration. This is one of those difficult things, especially in a society where there are so many voices asking for our attention. The television voices, the radio voices, your family voices, the friends voices, social voices, business voices, advertising, commercials. Isn't it amazing? You can turn off the television and the commercials keep running. How do you turn them off in your mind? That is the challenge to be mastered. The best use of time comes from putting plenty of value in it. And concentration means you take that challenge seriously. It's called careful investment for maximum results. Concentration. The big sports stars will tell you the cost of not concentrating. Just a little slip of concentration and they put one by your feet. And there goes first place and maybe the big money. So writing a letter, concentrate. Making a call, having a conversation. Trying to solve a problem, concentrate. You won't believe the effect this will have on your life. Now there is a time to let your mind wander, but it's a time you designate specifically for that purpose. At that appointed time, you can go off for that walk on the beach or that drive to the mountains, away from business. Let the breezes blow and your mind soar. Do some dreaming. That's healthy. But do it at that pre-planned time. At all other tasks, concentrate. Another aspect of managing goals and time is constant review. There's just no way to keep on target with your priorities without this. Whether it's business goals, personal goals, family goals, or investment goals, they must all be reviewed to see if you're on track, which is all the more reason for writing them down. Careful goal setting could be the time management answer you've been looking for. Goals well-defined and well-described and well-thought-out make us look carefully at the time we have and how to get the most from it to make all of our dreams come true. The answers to do better come from the necessity to do better. You will undoubtedly be amazed at the ideas you can come up with for the use of your time when goals and purpose have you stimulated to the maximum. Now there is a last main point to consider. You won't get everything you want. What a statement to make after studying how to get whatever you want. But you won't get everything you want. And the reason is, it's not that kind of planet. Sometimes it's going to hail on your crop and rain on your parade. I'm sure you are very well aware of this. But in my opinion, if you work the system I've just shared with you, you will get more than plenty. More often than not, you will get what you want. Those are good odds. 
There's no telling what you can do when you get inspired by results in advance. There's no telling what you can accomplish when you have goals and you believe in them. Just try this system for 90 days. Just try it. It may work even better for you than it has for me. I wish that for you. The fundamental process of knowing what information you need and gathering it is one of the keys to living the good life. Some of the best advice Mr. Schoff gave me in those early years was why and how to study. That's a key word for life change, study. If you wish to be successful, study success. If you wish to be happy, study happiness. Happiness is not an accident. It is first a study and then a practice. If you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. Would you like to guess how many people make wealth a study? Right, very few. Surely, since wealth and happiness and success are all values to cultivate, you would naturally assume that most people would make a careful study of them. Why they do not is yet another example of those aspects of life that fall into the category of mysteries of the mind. Remember, major keys to your better future are going to be ideas and information. If we have any lack, it is not because we lack money or opportunity or resources. It is because we lack ideas that have taken form from information. Many years ago, I learned that some of the best advice ever given comes from the Bible. There's a phrase in that amazing book that says, If you search, you will find. So that is the way to discover ideas and life-changing information. Search. In order to find, you must search. You must go to the seminars and to the training classes. You must listen to the cassette programs that can give you breakthrough ideas. You must go and engage in conversations with people of substance. You must go looking, go searching. Rarely does a good idea interrupt you. And as you make a diligent search you will find just the ideas you need. Now, here is the next key word in the process of seeking information that can change your life, and that word is capture. When you find a good idea, capture it. Don't trust your memory. Capture everything. Write it down. Record it. This is one of the reasons why we have put this program on cassette tapes, to capture the ideas. As a serious student of wealth and happiness, I would encourage you to make use of a journal as a gathering place for all the ideas that come your way. I consider personal journals to be one of the three treasures a wise person will leave behind. Here are those three treasures. One is your photographs. Take a lot of pictures. Being able to capture the event in a fraction of a second is a phenomenon of the 20th century and how easy it is to take phenomena for granted. I've gone to Taiwan to lecture three times in the last three years. On my last trip, there were about a thousand people in attendance for a weekend seminar. Now, if there were 1,000 people in the room, guess how many cameras were also in the room? Right, 1,000. Everyone brings a camera to capture all the events and the people, new friends, new experiences. I spend a big part of my time having my picture taken with everyone. Have you ever looked at the pictures a couple of generations back? Unfortunately, there are only a handful. But wouldn't it be great if there were hundreds of pictures to tell the whole story? So make sure you leave behind your whole story in your treasure of pictures. The next treasure to leave behind is your library. All the books you have chosen. Books well read, well underlined, with notes and observations and reflections you have written in the margins. 
the books that have helped shape your philosophy and the values of your life. That is a treasure, your library, and your listening library too. All these terrific cassettes, they are a treasure. The third treasure to leave behind is perhaps the most important, and that is your journals, containing all the ideas you have captured in your lifetime. Business ideas, social ideas, culture ideas, investment ideas, lifestyle ideas. Can you imagine the value these journals would have? They will certainly be more valuable to leave behind to your children than your couch. So get serious about your search for information and ideas, and about leaving that information behind for future generations. Here is the next key word for expanding your life for the better. That word is review. Go back over all your life experiences. Learn a skill called reflection, pondering life's events with the intent of learning. That is so important. I call it running the tapes again. The events of your life are some of the best sources of information. Don't merely go through your days. Get from your days. Be aware of what's going on around you, so that you will drive the grooves in the record of that day deep into your consciousness. Here are some good times to reflect. First, at the end of the day, take a few minutes and go back over your day, where you went and what you did and what you said, what worked and what didn't. What do you want to do again? What do you want to correct? The colors, the sights, the sounds, the conversations, the experiences. You see, experience can become commodity, currency, coin, an incredible source of value. But only if you take time to reflect on the experience and turn it into something of value. As we mentioned in our first fundamental, it's not what happens that makes the difference in how your life works out, but rather what you do about what happens. And part of doing something about what happens is this process of reflection, studying an event in order to glean valuable information from it. Another time to reflect is at the end of the week. Take a few hours. Take a half a day at the end of the month. Take a weekend at the end of the year. Reason: to make the past more valuable. Sophisticated people have learned how to gather up the past and invest it in the future. When my father was about to celebrate his 76th birthday, I said to him, "Father, can you imagine what it's going to be like to gather up the last 75 years and invest them in your 76th?" That's how life can become productive and exciting, not just living one more year, but gathering up the years and investing them in the next one. By reflecting, you can gather up all the conversations you have ever had and invest all that you have learned and all that you have felt in the next conversation. Gather all your experiences and invest all that you have learned and felt in your next experience. And the more value, the more substance, the more information, the more wisdom you can gather from all of your yesterdays, the more exciting your future becomes. Probably all of us already know all that we need to know in order to make our lives turn out the way we want, except for one thing: how to gather what we've learned, in order to invest it in what we want to become. So start a new discipline that can lead to wealth and happiness. Find out how things work. Never let it be said you didn't find out. Now let me give you a qualifying phrase: You may not be able to do all you find out, but make sure you find out all you can do. You don't want to wind up at the end of your life and find out that you lived only one tenth of it, and the other nine tenths went down the drain, not for lack of opportunity, but for lack of information. Let me share with you two of the best sources of information available. First, as we have mentioned, learn from your own experiences. Become a good student of your own life. It's the information you are most familiar with and feel the strongest about. So make your own life one of your most important studies. And in studying your own life, be sure to study the negative as well as the positive, your failures as well as your successes. Our so-called failures serve us well when they teach us valuable information. They're frequently better teachers than our successes. 
One of the ways we learn how to do something right is simply by doing it wrong. Doing it wrong is a great school for learning. Now I would suggest that you not take too long. If you've done it wrong for ten years, I wouldn't suggest another ten. But what a close at hand and emotionally impactful way to learn from your own experiences. When I met Mr. Shof, I had been working six years. I started when I was 19, and when I met him, I was 25. He said to me, Mr. Rohn, you have been working now for six years. How are you doing? I said, not very well. He said, then I suggest you not do that anymore. Six years is long enough to operate the wrong plan. Next he asked, how much money have you saved in the last six years? I said, not any. He said, who sold you on that plan six years ago? What a fantastic question. Where did I get my present plan that wasn't working well? Hey, everyone has bought someone's plan. The question is, whose? Whose plan have you bought? Now, those initial confrontations as you come to grips with your own past experiences may be a little painful at first, especially if you have made as many errors as I did. But think of the progress you can make when you have finally confronted those errors by becoming a better student of your own life. Now, the next way to learn is from other people's experiences. And remember, you can learn from other people whether they have done it right or wrong. You can learn from negative as well as positive. The Bible is such a great book because it is a collection of human stories on both sides of the ledger. One list of human stories is called examples, do what these people did. And the other list of human stories is called warnings, don't do what these clods did. What a wealth of information, what to do and what not to do. I think it also means, however, that if your story ever gets in somebody's book, make sure they use it as an example, not a warning. There are three ways to learn from other people. The first is to listen to the cassettes and read the books by and about people who've accomplished great things. All the successful people I know and work with around the world are good readers. They just read, read, read. They are so curious that they are driven to read because they just have to know. It is one of the things they all have in common. Here's a good phrase. All leaders are readers. And they use cassette programs too, especially while they're in the car or during other times when they can't read. Cassettes can help all of us easily pick up new ideas and new skills. Did you know there are cassettes and books on how to be stronger, more decisive, a better speaker, a more effective leader, have a better effect on other people, become more loving, develop personality, get rich, develop influence, become sophisticated, and people don't use them? How would you explain that? Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and told how they did it on cassettes like this and people don't want to listen? How would you explain that? The guy's busy, I guess. He says, well, yeah, if you worked where I work, by the time you struggle home, it's late. You've got to have a bite to eat, watch a little TV, and get to bed. You can't stay up half the night and read, read, read. And this is the guy that's behind on his bills. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere. But remember, you can be sincere and work hard all your life and wind up broke, confused, and embarrassed. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good reader, a good listener. At least he could hear a good cassette on the way home, right? Now, you don't have to read or listen to educational cassettes half the night. Although if you're broke, it's a good place to start. But here is all I ask, just 30 minutes a day. That's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but at least 30 minutes. Half rich isn't bad. 30 minutes. Hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day. And here's the next key. Every day, don't miss. Miss a meal, but not your 30 minutes. Hey, you can get along without some meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. There's a Bible phrase that says, humans cannot live on bread alone or food alone. It says the next most important thing to bread is words. 
Words nourish the mind. Words nourish the soul. Humans have to have food and words to be healthy and prosperous. Make sure you have a good diet of words every day. I told my staff one day, some people read so little they have rickets of the mind. And also remember to properly feed the mind, you must have good balance. Don't just read or listen to the easy stuff. You can't live on mental candy. Here is a thought. Why not call good books and cassettes tapping the treasure of ideas? That's it. Tapping the treasure of ideas, like you're doing with this program. And if somebody's got a good excuse for not tapping the treasure of ideas for at least 30 minutes every day, or spending the money and getting the books and cassettes, I'd like to hear it. Some excuses you wouldn't believe. I say, John, I've got this gold mine. I've got so much gold, I don't know what to do with it all. Come on over and dig. John says, I don't have a shovel. I say, well, John, get you one. He says, do you know what they want for shovels? Hey, invest the money. Get the cassettes and books. The best money you can spend is money invested in your self-education. Don't shortchange yourself when it comes to investing in your own better future. Mr. Shof got me started on my library when I first met him. He said to me, become self-educated. Standard education will get you standard results. Check those numbers and see if that's what you want. And if it isn't, if you want something better than standard, you must become self-educated. So I went to work on my library, and I now have one of the best. Shof recommended a couple of books in particular to get me started. Now, I had a Bible, that's 66 books, so that was a pretty good start, and my parents saw to it that I had a good study of the Bible. But the first book Mr. Shof told me to get was the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you don't already have it, it's a great one to add to your library. Earl Nightingale has put it on cassette. The title should intrigue you. Think and Grow Rich. I read it several dozen times. Shof said repetition is the mother of skill. And if you could have seen my bank account at the time, you would have known I needed lots of that kind of repetition. Some of the ideas in that book made major changes in my life. As I look back now, the book was worth thousands, and I bought it for pennies. I learned a very valuable lesson. There can be a great deal of difference between cost and value. Before I met Mr. Shof, I used to ask, how much does it cost? After I met him, however, I soon learned to ask, how much is it worth? I started basing my life on worth instead of cost, and everything changed. So that was one book he recommended, Think and Grow Rich. The next book he recommended I get was a book on nutrition. Shof said, study nutrition. Vitality plays an important part in doing well. Some people don't do well because they don't feel well. It's not that they're not intelligent. It's that they're ill. They don't have the fire and the vitality to do well. So he really got on me about nutrition. Now, some of those health books are a bit weird, but you can separate out the weird stuff. There are cassettes on nutrition, too. Remember, don't be a follower. Be a student. Someone says, I read this book. Should I follow? And the answer is no. Read at least two books and make up your own mind. Don't be a follower. Be a student. So take care of yourself. There's a Bible phrase that says, many times the spirit is willing, but the body's weak. So you have to work on both. You wake up in the morning and the mind says, let's go get them. And the body says, I can't even get out of bed. So work on your health. A person's library of books and cassettes reveals his or her most dominant desires. It's interesting to walk into someone's house and browse through the library. What does your library say about you? So read all the books. Now here's good news. You don't have to read them all at once. Try this, two books a week, in ten years is a thousand books. If you read a thousand books in the next ten years, do you think they would greatly influence all the dimensions of your life? The answer is, of course. Well, here's what's exciting. It's only two books a week. 
However, I would suggest if you haven't read two books a week for the last ten years, you are about a thousand books behind. Can you imagine the incredible disadvantage it will be ten years from now to stride into the marketplace a thousand books behind? For some confrontations, you won't be a match. And for some opportunities, your knowledge will be too lacking. For some values, your philosophy will be too shallow. Missing skills, missing knowledge, missing insights, missing values, missing lifestyle. It could happen if you don't read the books. Remember, the book you don't read won't help. You can't read too many books, but you can read too few. Now, the next way to learn from others is to listen. Become a great listener. Get around successful people and listen. Listen to what they say and listen to how they say it. There is something to be said for style as well as content. And never has listening to successful people been easier or less costly than it is today. With cassettes like the one you're listening to now, you can own cassette programs by and about the most successful people in any field. And you can listen to their ideas while you do something else. While driving your car, exercising, getting dressed in the morning, anytime. Listen over and over again until their ideas become your ideas, their inspiration, your inspiration. A lot of the books you're anxious to read, such as Think and Grow Rich, have been condensed and narrated on cassette. Your cassette library of great authors and ideas can be the investment with the greatest return of all. Great cassettes will do more than teach you great ideas. They'll also remind you of the important things you already know but sometimes forget. They'll lift your spirit. They'll keep your mind on what's important, on your goal and how you can achieve it. And what a modest investment for the seeds of fortune. Ideas well-written, well-spoken, well-received, well-learned, and well-invested can be your driving life force for wealth and happiness. Here's another way to succeed by listening. Choose a really successful person and take him or her out to dinner and listen. Ask questions and listen. If a man is poor, he can really help himself by taking a rich person out to dinner and listening. Spend 50, 60, 80, or a hundred dollars. Go for the full nine courses. Start with the hors d'oeuvres. Ask questions. The salad takes 15 minutes. Keep the conversation going. The biggest steak in town takes 45 minutes. Keep it rolling. Ask more questions. Pour on the dessert. Stretch the meal about two hours. See, if you get someone successful to eat and talk for two hours, he or she may drop ideas in your lap that could change your life. Multiply your income by two, by three, by five. But you're right. Poor people don't usually take rich people out to dinner. That's the problem. The man says if he's rich, let him buy his own dinner. I'm not coming up with any money. And besides, if you worked where I work, by the time you struggle home, it's late. You've got to have a bite to eat, watch a little TV, and get to bed. You can't spend all that time trying to find a rich man to feed. And this man's behind on his installment payments. Behind. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere. But remember, you can work hard and be sincere all your life and wind up broke and unhappy. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good listener. The third way to learn from others is to observe. Watch what successful people do. Here's why. Success leaves clues. Watch how the man shakes hands. People who do well do certain things over and over and over. And if you're clever, you can pick them up. Don't miss anything that could help you change your life for the better. Be a careful observer. We have covered a lot of ideas in this part, but what a major fundamental to wealth and happiness. The consistent, disciplined, purposeful, constant search for knowledge. It's where the life-changing ideas are. Pursue it with high expectations. Spend the money and time and the effort. They're all investments, time, effort, and money. But the payoff is so great, 
it's hard to compare the cost to the reward. First is the money, and it does take some money. I have a great suggestion for the cassettes and the books and the lectures, the seminars and the videos you need for a constant flow of ideas and inspiration. Set up an educational fund. Take a portion of your income each month and set it aside to invest in all the means of the search for knowledge. Remember, the best money spent is the money spent to cultivate the genius of your own mind and spirit. Make sure you don't spend more for accommodation than you do for education. The money, small price. The promise, unlimited potential. Next is the time. That is a valuable expenditure. I understand that. To ask people for their money, that's one thing. But to ask them for their time, that's a major request. But I don't know any shortcuts to this. It takes time, precious time. The time you spend is that much less time you have to spend. You can get more money, but you can't get more time. However, life has a unique way of rewarding high investment with high return. This major investment you're making now, listening, could be that small fine tuning you need for major accomplishment. And last, the investment in effort. There is a great deal of difference in casual listening and serious listening. Listening to know, listening to learn, listening that opens up the whole mental and spiritual process is truly an investment in effort. Bringing heavy attention to bear that takes effort. A mental rifle shot to strike the idea target. That takes a great deal of concentrated effort. However, this effort, high gear mental machinery, is the effort investment that opens the floodgates where ideas can work their magic for you in the marketplace. So, I do not hesitate to ask you to spend in deliberate, consistent fashion the money and the time and the effort. It's an investment that turns on the lights. Opens the windows, sharpens the focus, and starts turning wishes into pride, and product, wealth, and happiness. Of all the assignments Mr. Shope gave me in those early days when we were working together, personal development was probably my most challenging. Some things he taught me I caught on to right away, and some things took longer than I want to admit. This one I've been working on all these years, and I'm certainly not finished. I guess it is a lifetime project seeing what you can become. Personal development is truly the key to the good life. You see, what you become is far more important than what you get. The most important question to ask on the job is not "What am I getting?" The most important question is "What am I becoming?" However, it is also true that what you become directly influences what you get. Most of what we have, we have attracted by the person we have become. So here's the great challenge of life: you can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. That is the great focus of attention for life change. Now, on the other side of the coin, it reads, "Unless you change how you are, you'll always have what you've got." I've discovered that income does not usually exceed personal development. Sometimes income takes a lucky jump, but unless you keep growing out where it is, it will usually come back where you are. If someone hands you a million dollars, best you become a millionaire quickly, so you can keep the money. Life has strange ways. A very rich man once said, "If you took all the money in the world and divided it equally among everybody, it would soon all be back in the same pockets." I guess it is hard to keep what you haven't attracted by your own personal development. Personal development, how important! Remember, the major key to your better future is you. That's a sentence with a lot of value. I suggest you put it up somewhere for a while, where you can see it every day. Just to remind you, as you put your day together, I call it the silent seminar. 
the major key to your better future is you. For a share of my life, I didn't understand the importance of that phrase. Among a lot of things I didn't understand back in those early days. Back then, some things used to puzzle me. I used to wonder why two people could work for the same company and one make twice as much money. Why would one person be paid $2,000 a month and the other person $4,000 if it was the same company, same product, same service, same training, same weather, same traffic? Maybe they were the same age and went to the same school. Wouldn't that be a puzzle? Why would one person do twice as well? Speaking economically, I know there are many ways to do well, but in this narrow area called compensation... What is the difference? What is the difference between 2000 and 4000 a month? And I don't mean 2000 I could figure that out. Well, back then I tried to figure it out best I could. I thought time makes some of the difference. Some people do better because they have more time. I used to say, Harold ought to do well. He's got a lot of time. If I had all of Harold's time, I could do well. Now, that's got to be dumb, right? You can't get someone else's time. A man once said to me, if I had some extra time, I could make some extra money. I said, then you have to forget it. There isn't any more time. Where would you find any? Hey, when the clock strikes 12 midnight, that's about it. It's over. There isn't any more time. If you insist on finding more than 24 hours a day, they will come and take you away. So if we can't get more time, what could we get that would make the difference in economic results? And the answer is value. Value makes the difference. You can't get more time, but you can become more valuable. So value makes a major difference in how much money you earn. Now, here's a primary lesson in economics. We get paid for value. Bringing value to the marketplace is how we get paid. Whether you work on a job or whether you bring goods and services, we get paid for the value. Now, I know it takes time to bring value to the marketplace, but you don't get paid for the time. You get paid for the value. Mistakenly, the man says, I'm getting $20 an hour. And the correction is, no, not for the hour. If that was true, you could just stay home and have them send you your money. No, you don't get paid for an hour you get paid for the value you put in an hour. An hour is simply a convenient way to measure the value. So one of the important questions to ask is, is it possible to become twice as valuable and make twice as much money in the same time? Could you become three times as valuable and make three times as much money in the same time? And the answer is, of course. Yes, you can become more valuable if, and it's always if, right? Life is known as the big if. Harry Truman once said, life is iffy. How true. And here's the big if we are going to consider. It's possible to earn two or three or more times as much money in the same amount of time if you go to work primarily on yourself. And that's what we're considering in this session learning to work primarily on ourselves. Mr. Shelf put it to me this way when I first met him. He said, Mr. Rohn, if you wish to be wealthy and happy, learn this lesson well. He said, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. When he said that, I suddenly understood why I was broke. I was a hard worker on my job. If anyone would have asked me at age 25, Mr. Rohn, are you a hard worker? I would have said, yes, I'm a hard worker. Check my record. And that was true. I was a hard worker. But see, that was my problem. I was working hard on my job, but I wasn't working hard on myself. And that was the main reason for my lack of progress. See, it's easy to get faked out. The man says, I've got 10 years of experience. I don't know why I'm not doing better. What he doesn't understand is that he probably has one year of experience repeated 10 times. He grew pretty well that first year, and then he just did that first year nine more times. He didn't keep growing. 
Some people look for more money, but they look for it in the wrong direction. The man says, I need more money. I'm going to go to work on my boss. Hey, I found out bosses are notorious. They don't play fast and loose with the company till. I've never seen a boss get excited and triple somebody's wages. They don't behave in such an irrational manner. So that's not it. Some people say, I'll strike for more. Well, the problem with that is, once you start, you'll always have to strike. And I'll tell you what you get by demand. Little bitty pieces. Barely enough. And now inflation beats that approach, right? Inflation will usually equal or exceed a small wage increase, especially after taxes. Forget the little increases that just let you get by. Hey, you can get by with a crust of bread and a pair of shoes. But in this program, we are talking big success, not just getting by. The guy in sales says, I know what I'll do. I'll get me some of those sales books that teach the tricky sales. I'll put it on my prospects, dazzle them with my sales footwork, grab their money before they know what's happened. Well, you can try that, but my experience shows you wind up at the bottom of the economic ladder, not the top. See, it's not what you get by tricks that counts. It's not what you get by demand. It's what you get by performance that counts. And I found this out. Performance comes from inside, not outside. For the first part of my life, I was looking for the answers outside before I finally discovered they were inside. Success is not something you pursue. Success is something you develop. People are often asking me, how do you develop an above-average income? And the answer is, become an above-average person. Develop an above-average handshake. Some people want to be successful, and they don't even work on their handshake. As easy as that would be to get started on. They let it slide. They don't understand. Develop an above-average smile. Develop an above-average intelligence. Develop an above-average interest in other people. Develop an above-average intensity to win. See, that will change everything. Probably one of the most frustrating experiences in life is looking for an above-average job with above-average pay without becoming an above-average person. It's called frustration. Mr. Schoff one day gave me one of the most important statements of our entire association. I was giving him a rundown on how things hadn't worked out for me, and he said, Mr. Rohn, I have an answer for you if you will listen carefully. And listen carefully I did that day and for the next five years. If someone is wealthy and happy, you've got to listen. He said, Jim, I've only known you for a short time, but it is my honest opinion, for things to change for you, you've got to change. That was not quite the answer I was looking for, but that's the one he gave me. And now I bring it to you after pondering it all these years. For things to change for you, you've got to change, no matter what successes you've already achieved. Otherwise, it isn't going to change for you. Before I met Mr. Schof, I used to say, I sure hope things will change. That seemed to be my only hope. If it wasn't going to change, I was in serious trouble. Then I found out it wasn't going to change, and I was in serious trouble. Hey, remember, it isn't going to change. Not long ago, I did a seminar for a group of oil company executives during their convention in Honolulu. Sitting around this conference table, one of them asked, Mr. Rohn, you know some important people around the world. What do you think the next 10 years are going to be like? I said, gentlemen, I do know the right people. I can tell you. So they all listened very carefully. I said, gentlemen, based on the people I know and from the best of my own experience, I've concluded that in the coming 10 years, it's going to be about like it's always been. Aren't you glad you're listening? I don't share that with just everybody. Now, I said that to make a point, but I also said it because it's accurate. It's going to be about like it's always been. The tide comes in, and then what? It goes out. For six and a half thousand years that we know of called recorded history, and probably long before that, so it's not likely to change. It gets light and then what? It turns dark for 6,000 years. We are not to be startled by that now. 
If the sun goes down and the man says, What's happened? What's happened? Surely he just got here, I guess. Hey, it always goes down about this time of day. In rotation, the next season after fall is winter. And pray tell, how often does winter follow fall? Every time, without fail, for 6,000 years that we know of. Now, some winters are long and some are short. Some are difficult and some are easy. But they always come right after fall. It isn't going to change. Sometimes you can figure it out. Sometimes there's no way to figure it out. Sometimes it goes well. Sometimes it gets in a knot. Sometimes it sails along. Sometimes it gets in reverse. See, that's not going to change. The last 6,000 years reads like this. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. That's how it reads. It isn't going to change. The man says, well, then how will my life change? And the answer is, when you change. Whether I'm talking to high school kids or business executives, my message is always the same. The only way it gets better for you is when you get better. Better is not something you wish. Better is something you become. <laughs> 